So we're going to look at diastereoselective reactions, which uh, is taken from the isomerism and stereochemistry chapter. The first thing that we'll do is we'll define the diastereoselective reaction, and it's a reaction that leads to the preferential formation of one diastereoisomer of the product over the other diastereoisomer. And you'll remember that a diastereoisomer contains more than one chiral center. So we'll have a look at a couple of compounds and we'll play spot the chiral center. The first compound on the left here is minus carvone. And if we look for chiral centers in carvone, you'll see there's just one here. So indeed we have one chiral center in carvone and we cannot have diastereoisomers. If we now look at our second example, uh, minus menthol, and play spot the chiral center, we will see we have one, two, three chiral centers. So indeed, we can have diastereoisomers of menthol. And here's an example of one possible diastereoisomer. We have a different configuration at the top chiral center. So here the methyl group is pointing towards us. And this diastereoisomer is pointing away from us. But you'll notice that the other two chiral centers have the same configuration. So as one chiral center is different, but the others are the same, this indeed is a diastereoisomer of menthol. Let's have a look at an example of a diastereoselective reaction, in this case a nucleophilic addition reaction. And we're going to start by reacting this aldehyde group here with a Grignard reagent and then acid to form a secondary alcohol product. And you'll notice that in the aldehyde we have a chiral center and we've just represented the stereochemistry to show one enantiomer of the aldehyde. So this enantiomer here is forming this secondary alcohol product. In the secondary alcohol, this carbon atom is chiral. So we have two chiral carbon atoms, and so we have the potential for making diastereoisomers. We'll start by looking at the reaction mechanism, and this reaction is a classic nucleophilic addition. The electrons from this carbon-magnesium bond attacks the electropositive carbon in the aldehyde group, pushing the electron density onto the electronegative oxygen to form this tetrahedral alkoxide ion, which is then protonated to form the secondary alcohol product. In terms of chirality, there we have the existing chiral center, which was present all the way along in our starting material but we form a new chiral center, this one here, in the product. You might imagine that the Grignard could approach this planar aldehyde group from the top and the bottom face. If the Grignard approaches from the top face, as shown in green here, then the ethyl group lands up on the top, which is shown in this diastereoisomer. If the Grignard approaches from the bottom face, then the ethyl group lands up on the bottom of the molecule, and it's represented in this diastereoisomer. So these two compounds here are diastereoisomers and they result from either attack of the Grignard from the top or the bottom face of the planar aldehyde group. Let's now consider stereochemistry in defining R and S. So in my starting material here we have this chiral center we're showing a single enantiomer and this is the S enantiomer. We'll look at the products from this reaction. We have this diastereomer, which has the SR configuration, and this one here, the SS configuration. What you'll see is that this chiral center has the same configuration in both compounds. This new chiral center here is different. So these compounds are indeed diastereoisomers of one another. When you carry out the reaction, what you'll find is that these diastereoisomers are not formed in equal amounts. The SS diastereoisomer is formed around about three times as much as the SR diastereoisomer. You get this three to one ratio. So this is indeed a diastereoselective reaction. So this scheme considers the nucleophilic addition to a single enantiomer of the aldehyde. But what about if we're considering nucleophilic addition to a racemic mixture of the aldehyde? And that's what's shown in this scheme here. We've drawn both enantiomers of the aldehyde starting material, the S and the R, and these are present in a 50-50 ratio because we're using a racemic mixture. And we're now reacting each of these enantiomers with a Grignard reagent. 
We've seen that the S enantiomer of the aldehyde forms the SR diastereoisomer and the SS diastereoisomer in the ratio of 3 to 1. If we now consider the R enantiomer of the aldehyde, what we see here is that it forms the RS diastereoisomer and the RR diastereoisomer in the same ratio, 3RR to 1RS. The relationship between these two compounds is enantiomers, and indeed the relationship between these two compounds here is also enantiomers. They have the opposite configuration at both chiral centers. And the relationship between these two compounds is also enantiomers. Now it's unusual when you're drawing reaction schemes starting from racemic starting materials to draw all four of these isomers out. More commonly, the reaction is represented as shown here. So we're starting with our racemic aldehyde. We're not indicating the stereochemistry at the chiral center. We recognize we get an equal mixture of R and S enantiomers, and it reacts with the Grignard reagent to form a 1 to 3 ratio of diastereoisomers. And what we've shown here is just one set of isomers, the SR and the SS diastereoisomers. And what we need to recognize, of course, is that the other enantiomers of these compounds will be formed in, in the same amount. So the RS enantiomer of this compound will be formed and the RR enantiomer of this diastereoisomer will also be formed. When each diastereoisomer is shown as a single enantiomer, what we're indicating here is the relative configuration of the product, not the absolute configuration, the relative configuration. We'll finish up by looking at a couple of other diastereoselective reactions. And we'll start by looking at the reaction of this heterocyclic compound here, which contains a chiral center of S configuration, and look at the reaction of this compound with a base, followed by benzyl bromide, to introduce a new chiral center in the side chain. The new chiral center here can have the S configuration, or indeed the R configuration. And the relationship between these two compounds here is diastereoisomers. This chiral center has the same configuration, this one here has the opposite configuration. So in terms of the reaction, we take this base, which is called LDA, or lithium disopropylamide. We deprotonate at the alpha position of the amide to form an amide enolate ion. The amide enolate ion acts as a nucleophile, attacks the carbon. We kick out Br- as a leaving group, and we form these new carbon-carbon bonds. And you'll notice that these Two diastereoisomers are not formed in the same amounts. You get an incredibly diastereoselective reaction greater than 99% of this diastereoisomer um, over this diastereoisomer here. Finally, we're going to look at the epoxidation of an allylic alcohol, namely this racemic allylic alcohol shown here. We're going to epoxidize the alkene using a peracid called MCPBA, metachloroperbenzoic acid. And when we epoxidize the alkene, we land up with these two possible diastereoisomers. The epoxide is on the same face of the molecule as the alcohol, then that's called the cis isomer. If the epoxide is on the opposite face of the molecule with respect to the alcohol, then this is called the trans isomer. We're starting with a racemic starting material, but we're showing just one set of the diastereoisomers. We're not representing the enantiomers. We need to recognize that the other enantiomer of this compound will be formed in the same amount. The other enantiomer of this compound will also be formed in the same amount. Because we're just showing one set of diastereoisomers, then we're showing the relative configuration. And you'll notice here that this, again, is another highly diastereoselective reaction because we get 95% of this diastereoisomer and just 5% of the trans diastereoisomer.